glory to Jesus Christ. So we're on our spiritual reading of Thirsting for Prayer by Father Jacques Philippe. And we're on page 54 for those reading along. Actually, 55, page 55. The power of humility. So let's pray our prayer to the Holy Spirit in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who instructed the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, Grant that, by the gift of the same Spirit, we may be always truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Power of Humility The painful experience of our radical poverty should impel us towards humility and hope, which are basically inseparable. So authentic humility. This isn't uh, self-hatred or putting oneself down because that will tend one more towards despair than to hope. But real self-honesty in the light of Christ, the being uh, humble of heart, and, and being single-minded, focused on God. That it's not me that's going to determine everything. And, it, and it's not the worldly success in any sense of the word that matters. But my faithfulness and the humility really helps that. And hope, living in hope, but not uh, some vague optimism, but real hope, trusting in the Lord in all of these situations. Humility means recognizing that everything we are and have is a totally gratuitous gift from God's love. So this is every, our very existence is a free gift. You know, I didn't ask to be born, but I need the humility to accept that all the situation that I mean, the, the genetic disposition that I have, all of these things, and accept all of this, including my limitations, my physical limitations, but everything that comes from that as a gift from God, and that God can use this. And this is a totally gratuitous gift. It's a free gift. That's what grace means. Grace means a free gift. But what is it a free gift of? It's a free gift of God. Uh, sharing in the life of God, the eternal life. That's what grace, the sanctifying grace is, that's what that is. It's sharing in the Holy Spirit, sharing in the life of the Trinity. And indeed, God's love. The sharing in, his, in the divine nature, which is agape love. And that we can attribute absolutely nothing to ourselves. So, yes, I have to cooperate with, with God. And as St. Augustine said, God did not create us with our consent. But he will not save us without our consent. So we need to cooperate in this. But even that is from God. And the more we realize that, the more we grow in authentic humility. St. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 4, 7, What have you that you did not receive? And this is especially true in the area of the spiritual, indeed in the area of the prayer life. All of our virtues, all that, they're, they're growths of the gifts of God. They can, it's by grace. And salvation it's by grace alone that we're saved through a faith that works the love. 
So I can't boast of my faith before God any more than I can boast of my works before God. The, uh, a faith that doesn't work is dead. So it's, it, we're not buying our way in. We have to be like the publican rather than the Pharisee in the area of this humility in the parable of Jesus and Luke 18. Humility also means consenting peacefully to our limitations and weaknesses. Loving one's littleness and poverty, as Saint Therese of Lisieux put it in letter 197. Consenting peacefully to our limitations and weaknesses. What what is our what are our real limitations? So you'll be in the serenity prayer. And you know, grant me the wisdom, the uh, the serenity, the wisdom to know the difference between what I can change and what I can't change, and what should be changed, and what shouldn't be changed. And also that I can't change other people. I can be a catalyst for that by my example and various other things. But if people aren't, don't want to change, you can't be changed. It's like, you know, how many psychologists does it take to change a light bulb? Only one, but the bulb has to want to change. You know, that, that we are, are called to the reality of the freedom of humility and the humility of authentic freedom in God. It is vital for us to understand the unheard of power of humility and hope. St. Paul says, hope does not disappoint us, Romans 5.5. 5. St. John of the Cross states, one obtains from God so much as one hopes for. From Dark Night of the Soul, Book 2, Chapter 21. This is the most consoling idea of all. By hope we can quite certainly obtain everything from God. This is also true of faith, the, that unity of the three theological virtues, faith, hope, and love. Hope consists amidst radical poverty of total dependence on God, of expecting everything from God with full confidence. With the child, I confidence in the good father or good mother that you're going to get a child is going to get what he needs he doesn't even have to ask for it that because the the parent is is there for for him or her god will give his gifts according not to our virtues our qualities our merits or our good deeds but according to our hope so of course like faith, hope is bound to love and develops love. This is, is a, a ground for the planting of love. So in one sense, you can say the, the faith is the soil where the seeds of love are planted. Water, the water is hope. Or of course, you could reverse the images. Uh, that, but they all go together. They do. So it's not, you know, I'm not going to, God isn't going to say, well, it's all going to depend on you and what you do. We realize that it all depends on what God does and how we cooperate with that. The same applies to humility. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. 1 Peter 5, 5. He adorns the humble with victory, Psalm 149, verse 4. Humility has absolute power over God's heart. What an interesting image. So it's like the, like the joke about St. Anthony of Egypt in the desert. And the devil was throwing all sorts of things at him, all sorts of temptations, and he's sent special demons who specialized in different sins and temptations to get him. And so one of his most skilled demon tempters uh, showed up in the 
uh, infertile court there in hell. And he said, well, how's it going with Anthony in the desert there? And the demon said, well, it's not going all that well. He said, well, did you try this? And then he said, yes, I tried this. Did you try this? And stuff like that. He said, well, you have to put the heat on him. The, uh, the, the devil says to the, Satan says to the demon. The demon says, it's not the heat. It's the humility. The humility rather than the humidity. No, it's not the heat, but humidity. You know, that thing. But humility is one thing that... Uh, really cannot be uh, truly perverted. I'm talking about authentic humility, not false humility, not self-hatred, self-contempt, or that false humility that's actually a, a form of manipulation of other people. Uh, that, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the authentic virtue of humility, which is always driving us to throw ourselves upon God's mercy, always to admit that we cannot save ourselves, that we cannot do anything without God. Humility has absolute power over God's heart and attracts the fullness of his grace. So uh, humility is really crucial to authentic contrition, and, and, uh, sorrow for sin, not just because of I'm going to lose out on something, but because it's offending the very love of God. It's, it's going against the love of God. It's, it's chipping away or smashing the very love of God. It attracts, humility attracts his grace. So that's, I like that image too of a, of a, of a magnet, humility as a magnet of grace. But of course, grace precedes humility, as grace precedes everything. When humility is joined with hope, it compels God, quote unquote, so to speak, to come down and take care of us. If we could really measure the power of humility, we would consider that our greatest treasure is everything that obliges us to be humble. Our failings, our incapacities, our falls. The more the soul is afflicted, stripped, and deeply humiliated, the more it acquires with purity an aptitude for the heights. The height that it becomes capable of reaching is measured by the depth of the abyss where it has its roots and foundations, says Angela of Foligno in her Book of Wisdom, Visions and Instructions, chapter 19. If we wish to rise very high, we must first go down very low. St. Teresa puts it like this. I consider that the day when the humble revelation of ourselves has brought us many afflictions and sorrows is a greater grace from God than many full days of prayer. From the Book of the Foundations, chapter 5. Elsewhere, she says, the whole edifice of prayer is founded on humility. And the more a soul abases itself in prayer, the higher God raises her. From her spiritual autobiography, chapter 22. I recently read some passages from a 17th century French religious, Catherine de Bar, who founded 10 monasteries of Benedictines of perpetual adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. She beautifully describes the power of humility to attract God's grace. We do not know, or we do not want to know, the secret of how to ravage God's heart. Abase yourself. And despise yourself interiorly. The footnote. This invitation to despise oneself must be correctly understood, especially today when many people, for psychological reasons, tend to despise themselves, belittle themselves, or even hate themselves. That has no connection with the humility of the gospel, which consists 
on the contrary, of accepting one's poverty and being reconciled to one's weaknesses. Despising oneself here should be understood as recognizing one's radical poverty and accepting it peacefully with total confidence in God. So, and of course, this is also doesn't mean a spiritual laziness or uh, moral or intellectual or, or physical laziness. We can say, oh, I just can't do that. I'm uh, not even going to try. Now, there are some situations in which, you know, that's sensible. If someone says, you know, lift this 300 pound weight, I would quite sensibly say, I cannot do that. And this side of the resurrection, uh, I will not be able to do that unless I had some sort of device that could do it. But uh, that's that. I'm not, you know, so we, we have to know our limits and uh, the our legitimate limits, our true limits, and accept them. So it, it's, it's sad some people accept uh, intellectual limits for themselves, which are, are not the case. You know, there are children that are called, oh, you're just stupid. Uh, oh, the, you can't do anything. And they just accept that. And then they, they don't challenge themselves intellectually. They don't apply themselves intellectually because what's the use if I'm just so stupid and can't get anywhere? No, that is not humility. We're back to... Uh, Catherine de Bar, Catherine de Bar. That's a Lady Catherine de Berg. Wasn't she in Pride and Prejudice? Okay. But this is not that. Catherine de Bar is not that person. Uh, that character, apparently quite the opposite uh, from that character. Abase yourself, despise yourself interiorly, not in words, but in very truth. If you do what I tell you, all heaven will come and pour itself out into your soul, and you will overflow with so many graces that you will have enough to convert the whole world. No one can know or taste God except humbly. No one wants to be something. If it is not among the creatures, it is in God. And nothing in the world is so rare as to find a person who is content not to be anything at all, so that God can be everything in them. Everything in God, and God for himself. That is my state, and my one source of rejoicing, which nothing whatever can interrupt, not even my imperfections and sins, except nothing from yourself, but everything from our Lord Jesus Christ. That's from uh, Adore et Adere from uh, page 112 en français, je crois. Saint Therese of Lisieux also explains how greatly Humility attracts God's grace. Ah, let us then keep far away from everything that shines. Let us love our littleness. Let us love to feel as nothing. And then we will be poor in spirit and Jesus will come to look for us. However far off we may be, and he will transform us into flames of love. That's a letter 197 of uh, St. Teresa of the Child Jesus, Therese Martin de Lisieux. It is our lack of humility alone that prevents God from filling us with gifts as much as he would like and is able to do. Because our lack of humility makes us attribute to ourselves what is really a free gift of God's mercy. <coughs> God asks for nothing better than to fill us with himself and his graces. 
that he sees that we are so full of pride and self-satisfaction that it prevents him from communicating himself to us. For if our souls are not founded upon true humility and self-contempt, again, that self-contempt is not the uh, psychological uh, self-hatred or anything like that, but this is uh, not taking yourself too seriously, shall I say. That's, that's a great gift, not to take yourself seriously. And not to take other people seri that seriously either. But it's usually not, uh, it, it's usually diplomatically advisable not to tell people that you don't take them that seriously. Of that. Only God we take seriously, ultimately, and with great joy. in the sense of I'm not saying that we don't take people as a, that meaning what they're they're gonna do or mean, meaning what they're doing we you know that's it's another story but. if our souls are not founded upon true humility and self-contempt we are incapable of receiving God's gifts because our self-love will devour them. So God is obliged to leave us in our poverty, darkness, and sterility to make us realize our nothingness. That is how necessary the virtue of humility is. And humility is uh, much degraded, shall we say, in our current society and culture. It's, it's not even viewed, it's viewed as a vice, not ra rather than as a virtue among the worldly. And uh, humility is not only the, the key to hope, it's not only the key to real faith, and, uh, and the key to uh, giving ourselves to the one we love, to God, totally, it's also the key to uh, self-understanding and to, to happiness. Because if I have to be the center of attention, if I have to be the center of everything, and if everything has to be there for, uh, to pull, pull me up to, in the sense of inflating my ego, then I'm never going to be happy. Because life isn't like that. And we can live in all sorts of resentments because of that. And it's very easy to do that. I remember not too long ago, I was uh, publicly insulted by someone who knows better. And uh, totally put down. So I was, I'm never going to go to that particular meeting again. I was thinking of that. This is not that helpful. But then I said... I don't take this person that seriously in that area. And why should I take myself seriously in that area? Why, why should I uh, make myself vulnerable to insult? So it's one thing if someone's upset about something and then to examine it, but I usually rather to examine it when the person's in anger. So you sort of let the, the fiery dart cool off before you examine it. Uh, that's usually not the way. And the same, we shouldn't respond right off like that. We shouldn't react, shall I say, with that, but rather respond uh, in a, a well-thought and well-felt uh, way. There are times in which you have to respond immediately, but uh, a lot of the situations aren't like that. We can take our time in a lot of these things. And other things, we really don't even have to deal with them. We can just let them go. I don't have to give a, a clever retort to someone who's said something uh, nasty to me. I don't, I don't have to do that. I am called to be a fool for Christ. We're all fools in one way or the other. So you might as well be a fool for Christ just to be a fool for yourself or a fool for the world or a fool for this, that, or the other thing. 
because the, the world will view us as fools if we are striving by God's grace to live the Beatitudes. If we really want, uh, are striving by God's grace to put those teachings of the New Testament to effect, the moral teachings, the spiritual teachings, the uh, do to others as you would have them do to you, which is another, which a key law of moral behavior. We need this humility in all, we need humility in all, all the things. A, a virtue that is lacking in humility is not going to be a virtue that long. It's going to uh, dissolve. It's, it's going to be defective. So it's this, the virtue of humility as held in contempt as it is by the world, which actually in the sense is apt uh, because, because the world would hold it in contempt it, it, just as it holds meekness in contempt. But has their rejection of humility and meekness done any good? No, it's done the opposite. All the concern of quote unquote honor, it has brought death and destruction and true dishonor to the world, often. And the, the need to re respond in violence or to respond in some way like that. I don't uh, get angry, I get even attitude. What does that do to the interior self? What bitterness does that nurture and it can be very attractive this bitterness and so so sometimes you know we go years later we've been uh, uh dissed as they say disrespected so, by someone and and we can f bring that fight into into the present day you know 20 30 40 years later and get all riled up interiorly over it and it's gone. Maybe the person's gone. Maybe all of this is gone. <laughs> but uh, we would uh, drag ourselves back into that. So no wonder we have no time for the present moment dealing with the ish, the uh, the evils of the day, or or the issues of the day, or the problems of the day, or just this moment, the joys of the day, because we're dragging up all of this, dredging up all this stuff. That doesn't need to be dredged. Yes, this stuff, we need inner healing, healing of past things. We do have to face things in the past that we haven't faced interiorly. But we're not to wallow in it forever. So, because that's, that's an ego thing too, often, to be the, to the, this uh, professional victimization constantly doing that. Now, I'm not talking about dealing with real abuse that must must be dealt with and we shouldn't tolerate that but a lot of this other stuff it's it's not going to do me any good so if i don't have the humility to forgive and again this f forgiveness doesn't begin usually is with the emotions the emotions may come at the end the emotions may never come at all but it's the the will the acting in this and again we need the humility to do this. To, we know we have to rely on God's grace. That especially the deeper the hurt, the more we have to rely on God's grace for this, for this forgiveness. And again, forgiveness is not justifying what people did or brushing it off or not seeking amends or justice. It's not that. But it's not acting as the judge. And what does this resentment and bitterness do? It, it, it Does it really affect the other person? Usually not. Who is the one who is poisoned by this? I am, if I'm dwelling in this. And that was, again, see how necessary the virtue of humility, again, uh, Catherine de Bar and Adoré et Ad Erre, page 113. So. 
s'entraide. That's 103. Anyway. Uh, humility cannot be manufactured to order. So it's not, you know, if I just put these things together and put them on the assembly line, it'll just all, all happen. It can only come as the fruit of painful confrontation with our inner poverty and weakness. But sometimes this confrontation is a relief. Oh, I don't have to. I don't have to prove myself to the world. I don't even have to prove myself to me. I only have to be faithful to God and using the talents and everything that he's given me. Again, a humility is not the spiritual a laziness of not developing my talents. No, you develop your talents. Know that the talents are from God and, and develop them for the sake of God, for the sake of service of others rather than for my own ego inflation. So, you know, ego inflation is always dangerous. You get a balloon. If you want to break it the easiest way, you blow it up and you blow it up and you blow it up. In fact, if you blow it up enough, it'll break a burst on its own. And the same is true of our egos. Now, sometimes we, people use the word ego as a completely negative sense, but it just means I. And to have a real sense of self, we're not Buddhists after all, we, uh, we are to cultivate that, that uh, the self is a gift of God. But we, we have to be cultivating the true self rather than a false self, or an, a, a delusionary self, or a sinful self, a selfish self, a self-centered self. I am not the center of the universe. And the more I realize that, the freer I become. Humility frees. The more I realize that, the freer I am to love. To love not only God above all things, to love other people, but to love myself. And Jesus told us that, you know, quoting the Torah, with the Torah often gets a bad press of that because we often just quote the nasty parts, but not the sublime parts. Uh, I'm talking about the literal Torah, the surface reading of the first five books of the Bible. Uh, and not re re it should always be read in the oral Torah and in, as Christians in the apostolic tradition context. So we really need this humility. This, this is not an add-on virtue. This is a crucial foundational virtue for all the other virtues. Humility cannot be manufactured to order. It can only come as the fruit of a painful confrontation. As I said, sometimes it's a, it, the confrontation is a relief, the looking into ourselves, the f fearless moral inventory that AA talks about. It can be uh, frightening to, to a, a shallow ego. But what we need is a strong ego, a healthy ego, a sanctified ego, an ego centered not on myself, but centered on God. But so this inner poverty and weakness is actually a source of wealth and strength in God. A stripping of all human conceit and all the claims of our ego. Then the word pride in English has different meanings. It can mean arrogance, which is the vice of pride. But it can also mean uh, self-acceptance or, or uh, contentment in getting something done. So you get something, you, you know, paint a paint a door, and you say, this is a really good job, I'm, I'm, I'm really satisfied with this, I really enjoyed this. Well, that's not a trip of egotism, although one can make it so, as one with, through egotism can make anything a trip of egotism. That's just 
a, a self-appreciation, which we need to do. Appreciate us, ourselves as gifts of God to ourselves and to the world, which takes responsibility. That I have to live as a gift to the world. I have to live as a gift to myself and take myself lightly. A, a classic... A line from G.K. Chesterton is angels can fly because they take themselves so lightly. And we often need to do that too. Not that we don't plan, not that we don't take ourselves as a, in an honest way, but we also have to realize that I'm not the center of the universe. I'm not the center of my own universe let alone of the universe or multiverse or whatever there is out there, or anybody else. A friend of mine, there was this person that he was uh, working with, and the person would say about, about, about everything, this person, well, I just don't care about that. So, but, and my friend was tempted to give all sorts of retorts. But what he did say, well, it means a lot to me. And if it doesn't mean a lot to you, then that's fine. It doesn't have to mean anything to you. So he had the humility enough to, that, to appreciate that things that are valuable to him were not necessarily valuable to other people. But things that he loved, if the other people didn't have to love. And uh, no, one had, no one had to agree with him on anything in the long run, as long as... He was faithful to the truth that he was pursuing with uh, a strongly informed conscience. Human conceit and all the claims of our ego. That's ego in the negative sense there. Humility does not consist of having humble thoughts, but of sustaining the weight of the truth, which is the abyss of our extreme wretchedness. But it pleases God to make us feel it. So if I'm nothing in the eyes of the world, well, I'm free. I still have obligations to human society, but I'm not the center. There was a book, God is My Co-Pilot. No, humility is God is my pilot. I am my co-pilot. And maybe sub-pilot is more like it. So, people who want to run my life or your life or anybody's life, they're usually not very good at running their own, as it turns out. But the thing is, I, we should really want God to run our lives. Because we're not doing a very great job of it on our own. Or, what is worse, letting the world, letting Hollywood, letting Wall Street, letting whatever, run our lives. Dictate to us what is supposed to be uh, real or unreal, or... Are, are valuable or not valuable. Much of what the the worldly value are not in themselves particularly valuable. There was this, this saying, or a chilling saying, I thought, if uh, the one who dies with the most toys wins. Well, no. The one who dies with the most love wins. The one who lives with the most love is the one who's Live, really living the most. But of course, humility does not take this competition. No, I'm not talking about competition that's you know, necessary for work or whatever. But we're not competing with other people before God. We're not competing before God, or even we shouldn't be competing before the world, 
for to be acclaimed over other people, to have people under us. And it's great arrogance to use other people just as a ladder to quote unquote get ahead. There was this book in the 60s called A Child's Book called Hope for the Flowers about this caterpillar. I think it was in, it was, uh, anyway, it was yellow. I, that's about all I remember about it, really. Well, it's about this caterpillar who finds this column of caterpillars going way up into the clouds. And all these caterpillars are going up, so he starts to go up. And... He was thinking, well, what's up at the top must be really great. But you have to step on the other caterpillars to get ahead. So that's what they're doing. And then uh, he gets to a point with the thing, and he's just, he finally gets to the top of the column. It's above the top. But all the caterpillars are like falling off the top because there's really nothing there. It's, not. So then he starts going down, and he said, going down is a lot easier than going up. They were all making room for him to take his place as he's going down. He's saying, there's nothing there, it's not worth it, and stuff, and they just think he's crazy and a fool. So he goes down, he gets down in the end, and then he goes to a branch, and then he, you know, weaves a, uh, a chrysalis, and then he emerges as a butterfly in the end and flies off. And that's hope for the flowers. So we need the humility to know that, you know, stepping on other people is not good. Due to what this issue would happen due to you, do I want this person to uh, step on me? Well, I should not step on that person. True humility values other persons as persons. The Dalai Lama said, we're to love people and use things but we so often use people and love things. Now, we can take delight in things. In fact, we probably should if we're really humble and really appreciative of God's creation. St. Francis, who was utterly poor, uh, totally destitute, sick, all sorts of things, instead of lamenting all of this, he rejoiced in nature as the temple of God. And he uh, d was developing joy and so on. Even his death, but what uh, is related by eyewitnesses, there, there was joy to it. And concern about other people even when he was dead. So he had someone bring the biscotti or something, this uh, Fratello Giacomo, they call, who was actually a woman. And... Uh, she was coming with, he said, bring these things, bring, uh, you know, wax to make the candles for my funeral and bring something to make a shroud or something for a shroud or whatever. And, uh, and but bring biscotti, these uh, the cookies that she made that were really good. He, when, he couldn't eat them himself, but he enjoyed that other people would be able to eat them around him and all this stuff. So this joy that he had in his sorrow, this joy that he had in his illness and pain and so much of it was rooted in his humility these words sound austere the abyss of our extreme wretchedness to uh, get in touch with that but they contain a sweet and gentle mystery one of the strangest and most beautiful experiences of the spiritual life is this. In the times when we feel crushed by our own wretchedness, but recognize that we are wretched and consent to it fully, then we accept to live in our nothingness, so to speak, and not to try to escape, because it is the truth. Then God visits us with tender consolation, and we feel clearly that all the riches of his love and mercy belong to us. Our poverty makes us infinitely rich. That's something worth, you know, writing on, on a wall. But 
only your own wall. I don't want vandalism and graffitiism, especially nowadays. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. One of the Beatitudes, but a crucial Beatitude, Matthew 5, 3. Therese of Lisieux says that no joy can compare with the joy tasted by those who are truly poor in spirit with that a sense of utter dependence on God, that everything is a gift, that everything can be approached with gratitude, even our wretchedness, even our illnesses, even our debilities, even the things like, because I'm getting older, and who isn't getting older? You don't get younger. Uh, there are all sorts of things that aren't what they used to be, and, you know, when I try to do the exercises and follow the right things and do all this stuff, it's still a problem. You know, but running, running at least an hour and a half, really running an hour of, of, of every day for 30 years has left an effect on my ankles, my joints, my knees, my back, all this. But I have absolutely no regrets of that. So uh, I still run in my dreams and enjoy it. But the Lord is all in all. And so pursuing God in that and realizing that everything else is going to fall away. As one wit once says, there are no luggage racks on a hearse. There are no pockets in a shroud. It's, you can't take it with you. But what we can take with you, what we can take with ourselves, is love. Everything of love. Even the virtues that prepare for love, the two theological virtues of faith and hope. At death, after death, we don't need those. But we need love because that's the very essence of what heaven is. The very nature of God. Heaven is un, unrestricted, unencumbered unity with God, communion with God. And humility opens us to that. Or as I've said before, it's foundational to all the virtues. But it's hard, not only because society doesn't go along with it, but our own, our own sense of self-importance doesn't go along with it. We are important. We're infinitely important. But so I'm infinitely important. You're infinitely important. But so is every other human that ever existed. In fact, God loves every creature, loves everything. Every snail, every mosquito, all that. Yeah. Why he made mosquitoes, I don't know. But there it is. Uh, there's evolution for you. But the, uh, we do be poor in spirit. No joy can compare with the joy tasted by those who are truly poor in spirit. Truly dependent, truly grateful. For everything. Not only the pleasant, but the unpleasant. To wrap, knowing that, having the humility that God is fulfilling his promises. That God can use everything we really turn over to him. To round off this subject, here are some beautiful words by a Carthusian. That's a religious order, a strict, contemplative, and uh, eremitical hermit life in, in a community. In an article about the prayer of the heart, on the deep and positive meaning of this experience of poverty and weakness, which is an integral part of the spiritual life, it is the foundation of true love. Even in the natural order, all genuine love is a victory of weakness. Loving is not dominating or possessing, not imposing oneself on the person loved. Loving means that one welcomes the other person without putting up any defenses. In return, one is certain of being welcomed totally by that person without being judged, condemned, or compared. That's if the other person is pursuing authentic and mature love. There are no more trials of strength between the two people who love each other. So it's not, I have to get ahead, I have to be better than this and the other thing. Uh, it's not needed. It's love, 
demands cooperation rather than competition. There are no more trials of strength between two people who love each other. There is a sort of mutual inner intelligence, thanks to which one can no longer fear any danger, whatever, coming from the other person. Because the, the other person is also in this pilgrimage of love, in this pursuit of love, in this dedication to love. This experience, even if it always remains imperfect, is already convincing, and yet is only a reflection of the divine reality. From the moment we begin to believe truly in our hearts, in God the Father's infinite tenderness, we feel in some way compelled to descend further and further into a positive, joyful acceptance of not having, not knowing, and not being able. This does not entail any unhealthy self-humiliation. We are simply entering into the world of love and trust. That's from Jean-René Boucher in Parole du Chateau, Chatreur. Ch Parole de Chatreur. The speeches of the Charterhouse. Perspectives de vivre religieuse. Perspectives on the Religious Life, for page 99. Since uh, the footnote is referred in French, I assume there isn't an English translation. Going down into ourselves, number 11. Let me use an image to put everything I have just said in a slightly different way and for express what we experience if we persevere in prayer, both as suffering and, at the same time, as happiness. Someone who persists in praying day after day is like a man who acquires an old house in the country with a well in the garden. The well has not been used for maybe a hundred years and is blocked up. The man thinks it would be a good idea to restore it to use, so he starts clearing it. To begin with, it is not very pleasant. He finds dead leaves, stones, mud, all sorts of rubbish, some of it quite disgusting. If he does not give up, but continues toiling away, in the end he discovers at the bottom of the well water that is clear, fresh, and unbelievably thirst-quenching. I wanted filtered first after all that muck and stuff, but anyway. That is how it is for us. Faithfulness in prayer involves a painful confrontation with what we have in our hearts. There we find things that weigh us down, tangled things, dirty things. But the day comes when deeper down than our psychological wounds, even deeper than our sins and dirt, we reach a pure spring, the presence of God in the depths of our hearts, enabling our whole selves to be purified and renewed. He who believes in me out of his heart shall throw rivers of living water, John 7, 38. Human beings are not purified from the outside inwards, but starting from within. Not so much by a moral effort we make, and he's not putting down moral effort by any means but by discovering a presence with a capital P, a presence within us, and letting him act freely, because this presence, this force, is not just a force, but a person. Indeed, three persons of one being. And letting him act freely, having the humility to let God be in charge of our lives, and in charge of our spiritual lives, of letting God go, knowing that God knows better than we do. That's not easy. By faithfulness to prayer, we find within us a space of purity, peace, and freedom. God's presence, closer to us than we are to ourselves. The center of the soul is God. 
says St. John of the Cross. We learn little by little to center our lives on him and no longer on our wounded psychological periphery, our fears, bitterness, aggressiveness, jealousies, etc. Not that we don't take that in reality and be willing to go through those things. We all want to go around them, but often that's not the case. The, often the deeper our pains of the past and present, the more we have to go through them. And it's not a quick journey through them, usually. But God's grace is there. God's love is there. And I don't have to be successful in the eyes of the world. So, yes, use all your talents or, and, and cultivate what you can cultivate by the power of grace. But don't let the, all this stuff weigh you down and crush you. Don't let it get you off the real priorities of life, which is loving God totally with all you are and loving your neighbor as yourself. Loving yourself. What real love is. Loving other people serving other people in this way. So we're to be servants of all, but slaves to none, and have the humility for that. It's interesting, the word humility comes from the same root as, as humus, as, as a fertile soil. Human beings are not purified from outside inward. By faithfulness to prayer, we find within us a space of purity, peace, and freedom. We learn little by little to center our lives on him, on God, and no longer on our everything else, especially that's all the problems, all the pains, all the stuff. Our fears, yes, we face that. Our bitterness, we seek healing of that. Our aggressiveness, we need to deal with that. Our gen uh, jealousies, our envies, our, our ambitions that are not centered on the productive. This kind of interiorization, which is one of the fruits of prayer, is much more than simple recollecting ourselves. It's not just sitting in a, in a chair and closing your eyes and trying to get it all together. It is discovering and uniting ourselves to an inner presence with a capital P that becomes our life and the source of all our thoughts and actions. I will come back to this point. So we'll stop there and go on 12. Prayer is an act of love next Wednesday. Oh, so we're almost halfway through. We're Almost halfway through the book. There we go. And let's wave back Timothy Mills. Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. Joe O'Brien. Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. Father Paul Ring. Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. Robert Hart, Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. Walter Byrne, Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. Gary Graveline Sr., Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. Barbara Reedy, Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. Will God bless us all, everyone, as Tiny Tim said. Not the singer, the Dickens character. God bless us all. Amen. <laughs>